Yeah, and it's not arbitrary that we think of Mother Earth and Mother Nature. I mean, those are not, I mean, there there is a mentality that wants to look at that and so say, oh, these are these really anachronistic or old-fashioned or um, inappropriate um uh, almost sexist ideas, like we shouldn't be associating, you know, nature with womanhood or something like that, or nature with mother or nature with earth, that these are all biases and prejudices. And my response is no, they're not biases and prejudices. There's something actually, um, there's knowledge there. Um, now we can look at that knowledge and say, well, okay, now we're at a different point in history and we need to understand that knowledge a little bit differently. Sure. Great. But don't throw it out. There, there's some primary intuition there that we need to keep coming back to. Why do we associate mother with nature, mother with matter, mother with earth? Yeah. I think it's an, it's, it's an inaug- acknowledgement of what was and what is versus an acknowledgement of what you want it to be. You know, there's a, there's a big difference between the two. And I think that those, they don't, they can be friends, the desire for something new and the acknowledgement of what is like material reality. But I think you have this big clash in society, right? Of maybe tribes of people who want to uh, hold on to some level of reality and other people who want to nuke the entire idea of what we know so that a new reality can flourish. And I don't know what reality is um, that they hope for. Um, I just know that there seems to be an antagonism against uh, what is uh, regardless if it is positive or negative, um, it just seems to be uh, wholly discarded as, you know, arbitrary when it's, uh, I know you, you've, you've clearly illustrated to me that certainly things are not just what they appear to be, that they do have deeper meaning and you can learn so much uh, by even learning about a word, you know, when I learned about the word, uh, the root of the word digital and how it connects to the hand and numbers and numbers itself are the basis of science and regarding computer science, you know, and I'm a bit of a computer nerd. So I always bring things, <laughs> bring things back to computer science, but yeah, I, I think all those things matter because they, they open, um, a, a portal for you to see how things inform each other. I, um, you know, I, I wonder why, uh, f- postmodernism, right. And the manifestation of it, I'll say it that way because I, I think it's really, uh, you said something important in saying that it's not necessarily a goal as much as it is a, a type of manifestation, but I'm curious, curious about why the manifestation of postmodernism around gender seems to be in full full swing right now and uh is it something historical is it something um regarding oppression um and uh societal upheaval around politics you know during i i'm not quite sure if i've personally pinned um why now Uh, maybe you have and you have some insight into all all of the above Mm. You know, there's just so many things that we could throw into this um, stew. I mean, there's just so many different aspects. On the one hand, you know, technological innovation has been so astounding within the last couple hundred years that we really are living in a different material reality. And a couple hundred years ago, the different roles for different sexes had a certain legitimacy or rationality that just doesn't exist anymore. I mean, there's, there's just just no reason to have um, people of different sexes doing such dramatically different um, jobs in the world because, you know, we're just not struggling for existence in the same way. We're just not living in the same world. So in that sense, it makes, it makes perfect sense that we're just completely um, deconstructing. I'll use the word deconstructing um, Mm. that, that binary. 
in a sense, right? Technology is the great equalizer, right? What's that? Uh, technology is the great equalizer between the sexes. Right. And so, I mean, with there's a certain amount of good reason that we can, you know, look at a lot of the gender stereotypes and say, well, that's silly. I think what but what people don't understand is that those stereotypes were had a certain rationale. Those those differences had a mm-hmm. certain rationale that might not have have might not be pertinent now having said that um we still continue to be two different two different creatures in a sense um and uh we need to keep that in mind too that binary of men and women still exists we are um amazingly similar and there are real differences and that's that's still the case but those are going to have different manifestations because we're living in a completely different world um it's you know another thing that i that i'm thinking about a lot lately and i'm not sure if i i I probably won't be able to answer your question because it's just such a complex one but um, we're doing the best we can a lot of lately is the is the archetype of the eternal youth the puer eternus the peter pan figure um which is also a figure who um is always in opposition to um authority figures he's in opposition to tradition he's also in opposition to binaries in in opposition to to simple dichotomies and, and um, peter pan peter pan is very feminine looking uh peter pan is very feminine looking too for that reason it's portrayed on purpose that way yeah and there's and if you actually go back to the work by jm barry you know the the play yeah. or the novel you can see that it's it's filled with androgyny right and, yeah, and yeah. it's filled with the androgyny of childhood because Right. When you're a child, when you're prepubescent, of course, there is a lot more similarity and there aren't those stark differences, um, you know, just because you haven't physically developed in, in you know, pu- puberty hasn't hit. And so there's like a natural androgyny in childhood. And you can see that a lot in a work like Peter Pan. And you can I think you can see it a lot in um both the, the mentality of childhood and e- even the the, men t- the mentality of like early adolescence, you know, adolescents tend to be very androgynous. And then the, the older you get, I think a lot of times there's there's like a, a greater dichotomy um, or a, a binary starts to show up. I don't know. That's how I'm thinking about it. But to kind of get back to this idea of like, why are we having this this sort of wild discussion about gender and 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 sex and the relation between the two and the binary i think a lot of it i mean i'm thinking of it in terms of this sort of archetype of the eternal youth that wants to say well no it's kind of all just pretend and um it's all just you know those are just sort of false constructs that the 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 older people have given to us but we don't have to you know we don't have to abide by those and and um really we can we can exist kind of in a world of play a world of pretend a world where you can be anything you can be anyone it's also a very american thing too right this idea that you know you can be whoever you want to be um and in jungian psychology it's the senex or the the, the old man or the patriarch who says actually no you can't you're subject to time and space you have limitations you can't be anything you want to be that's just not life there are things like gravity i can't fly you know um there there's the senex is the archetype of uh limitation temporality um mortality um everything that's kind of in up op- in opposition to the eternal youth yeah, I don't. I hope that makes sense because it I, makes so much sense because it's just on my own for so long that I don't know sometimes if it's just 
Well, if you're ever in New York, you know, you're always welcome to come by in person. Uh, but so you don't have to be alone and we can, <laughs> we can talk about this in person, <laughs> but no, you, you, I think you've really opened up so many wonderful ideas and, you know, things that I, we're going to keep talking about. And, you know, I think the idea of the father, for instance, you know, the, uh, you know, there's, it's kind of taboo for the father to be the stern, uh, dream breaker, you know, like we, uh, we consider that to be almost like toxic, the, the father who's, uh, sort of putting reality into perspective and, um, you know, I would like to open up a a conversation around masculinity because, uh, what what I tell people and what my belief is around masculinity is that there's archetypal information there. You know, uh, the, the archetypes of King warrior, magician, lover, um, for instance, it's a, a, a great book by, uh, Douglas Gillette. And, uh, I, I, I take those archetypes into, um, into my discussions with friends, uh, who are struggling in their lives and sharing them the, the wisdom of, uh, why it's important to sort of go through the, the pathway of seeing what the archetype can do for your, for, for you and for your, your own, uh, character limit limitations, uh, uh, whether through your past pain or your current pain that you're holding on to, um, so that you can go through a transformative experience and use an archetype as at least a, uh, as due North, you know, as, as, as something you can see as an ideal. I, th- I think I tweeted, uh, something like that recently recently how the uh, destroying the idea of the ideal in the masculine comes with great repercussions because we need ideals to have some sort of guide map on you know what we can be it's 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 you know i think it's how lucky i am for instance that i've i have a father who is such a role model to me my father is you know, me and him are very close and that's not something a lot of guys can say and you know so i whenever i think of the divine father figure i think of my own dad and i'm very blessed and lucky to 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 say that um so maybe you know it, it for me there's this natural idea of uh what the father is and his role in society and and i think it it, um excuse me i forget the name of the the archetype you mentioned but that archetype is uh the one that shows you the boundaries and limitations you know i think that's is it related to the father in some sense yeah it's the senex another senex it is father time Um, oh wow (laughs) yeah yeah and it's um i just have to point out that robert bly passed away yesterday oh did he Yes. And oh, wow. So it's incredibly appropriate that we're talking about <laughs> these themes right now. And wow. before you started speaking, I was going to say that, you know, Robert Bly said that in the U.S., um, th- there's an absence of the father. You know, it's just a complete, and that our country was even, in a sense, founded on a rejection of the father insofar as a king is kind of a father of a country and we rejected the king and we're still sort of suffering from that that consequence in a way and i think there is something in american culture that really is um a rejection of of the father and everything the father represents which is things like you know limitations um discipline um you know a, a lot of the a lot of the values that are associated with just manhood and masculinity. And I think our culture has done a a good job at um, vilifying a lot of that um, toxic masculinity. I mean, the phrase itself says everything, doesn't it? And uh, that's a blank, a blanket condemnation. Yeah. And, you know, like, like with a lot of things, I understand why it's there. I'm not saying that people shouldn't use that term, but God damn, let's unpack that because uh, there's a lot of masculinity that 
is really, really valuable and really necessary. And that's not going to change over. I mean, that's the, that's still the case. It was the case and it will continue to be the case. Um, and in losing ideals, like you were saying, and role mm. models, we're losing any sense of continuity too. intergenerational continuity. You know, when when father son relationships break down, so much else breaks down. Um, yeah, fa- fathers are are largely empty, you know, uh, and in the role of the their families, you know, um, and you see the repercussions of that, you know, the cases of depression and self harm skyrocket uh, whenever a, a father uh, isn't present. Um, I think of the most recent example. I, I forget the high school, but there was a high school. There was a lot of violence going on with the uh, with teens and somewhere in America, and. Uh, a group of fathers decided to take it upon themselves to uh, go to go to the school and wear like a t-shirt like dad's you know on something like dad's on patrol or something something silly and uh, but all of a sudden the violence went down and kids started uh, talking to them about their problems and you know oh I'm not getting along with Jane because she's like mean to me and then the father's giving that fatherly order right the order the structure and order of why do you care care what Jane thinks. Why are you allowing her to trigger you? You need to take control and put, giving kids the agency, the emotional regulation, which is something I think is is a critical part of you know the complex of the child uh, um, is lack of emotional regulation. And so I was just was so happy to see those fathers. Um, you know, and these guys aren't trained. This is why archetypal energy is important because you have just men giving uh, uh, their sense, uh, in a sense, their essence, right? The essence of why do you care? Why are you allowing and giving your agency away, you know, and, and putting that power back into these children and all, seeing the violence immediately stop? You know, I think that that is what's uh, needed. And it's a great example of why this type of, uh, the, you know, the, I mean, I, I use the word divinity, you know, um, and to me, divinity in some sense means an ideal, you know, um, I don't mean it in the spiritual sense of it, like, you know, although, it, you know, you could relate it that way too. But um, to me, it's just, uh, you know, the divine archetypal masculine energy, you know, that um, there's, it provides so much order and resilience and structure and an emotional strength, you know, in a way that I think is a little bit different than feminine strength. Sure. And, you know, I, we don't have to, I mean, it's not as if in speaking in this way that we're saying that women can't provide order and structure and strength and all sure. these things. It's just that for reasons that some of which might be obvious and some of which might not be, it seems to be, to be a little bit more prominent on, on one side of the binary than the other. But I mean, for me, the way I think about it is like fundamentally all of us are androgynous and we all have, you know, the, the masculine and the feminine just in different proportions, um, which doesn't mean that we're all both literally male and female. I think that's one of the, the big confusions is that we're not understanding metaphoric androgyny as metaphoric androgyny anymore. But getting kind of getting back to what you're what you're saying is like, OK, I mean, that those qualities that we associate with masculinity, like order, um, you know, structure, these types of things in one form or another, they have to be present. They're necessary. Um, they're, they're part of wholeness, you know, and Jung's whole idea of psychological development is that you want to work towards wholeness. So, if you want to be a whole integrated person, you need to have a sense of order, um, discipline, fixity, all of these things that, you know, we associate with masculinity and, you know, we could name a hundred other qualities. Sure. I, I wonder how much, uh, of that 
pathway, right? The pathway towards these qualities in, in the masculine um, relate to uh, how much violence the on average men are subject to, you know, um, and expected to, you know, there's a, and so what I'm really getting at is the word danger, you know, there's a dangerous element that, you know, you better watch what you say and have a good control of language and what it means because saying something to the wrong guy as a, as a male, it, it, it's not going to come at the same consequence of, let's say a woman, a woman saying something nasty to a guy. She'd be like, oh, you know what? And you're an asshole. Fuck you. <laughs> and then, you know, it, maybe it ends at that. But if I say that to a guy that could, that could lead in my life uh, being over, you know? So there, there's an element of uh, danger. I think danger is a component to masculinity and why the uh, stakes are so high with uh, needing to organize oneself, needing to, you know, put the pressure on themselves to emotionally regulate as well so that, you know, you're not killing, you're, you're not dying and you're not getting into f uh, fights all the time. Yeah. You know, Bill Burr has a great routine on this. He's talking <laughs> about... You know, you, you know that. It, I mean, it, it. I won't be able to repeat it with his, you know, in, in with his voice. But he, he says something along the lines. You, you know what? You know this type of shit I would do if I was a woman and know that knew that like this <laughs> cultural imperative that you can fuck with me. And he, and he like uses this example. I'd, I'd like go to the gym and see some huge, you know, muscle bound dude and just like, you know take his protein shake and throw it in his mouth <laughs> and hit me. I'm a woman, you know, um, and that type of thing. Um, and in the context, it's fucking hilarious, but yeah, the, no, that's, I mean, you're absolutely right. And mm -hmm. it, it's, it's fascinating. I think a lot of people really don't get that at all. Um, it's kind of depending on maybe their, their own background and, you know, personal experience. I, I used to work on fishing boats up in Alaska. I did that for years. Yeah. I remember seeing that. You, you gotta, you be, you gotta be careful who you, who you talk to and how you talk to them because you know, someone can friggin' throw you overboard and th that kind of thing happens. And you, when you're dealing with people who, uh, you know, are working 16 hours a day, it's physically rigorous, like, difficult friggin work it's like you got to be disciplined you got to be hard you got to be careful you got to watch what you say to people absolutely what, what they say to you too and mm -hmm. everyone's nerves are like on edge because nobody's sleeping enough which is even more reason to like have a certain amount of control and composure and, you know, there's this whole strain in our culture, I think, that just looks at control and composure and thinks, ah, this is um, this is toxic. This is nothing more than a, uh, an unfortunate legacy of patriarchy. And my response is a, a legacy of patriarchy. But let's not say it's completely unfortunate. There's value there, too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, I find that yeah, more childlike men or boys, if you want to call them that, uh, tend to be very flippant. You know, it's, it seems like they've never, uh, I think Mike Tyson said something like that, where people who have uh, big mouths just ha haven't gotten punched in the face hard enough. Absolutely. You know, speaking from a boxer, <laughs> uh, you know, um, I think that that means something for sure. Uh, I think a lot of usually the guys who I see who uh, have the biggest mouths, you know, they haven't a exactly experienced what you have out there on the, you know, the, the, the fishing docks with these types of sailor dudes yeah. who would throw you overboard if you got a <laughs> out of line, you know, like, um, yeah, I used to work in aviation. I've mentioned that to you. And uh, it, the culture is similar, you know, um, where it's very militant and yeah, you have so much risk involved with uh, post 9-11 security and then the FAA 
and legitimate danger because if you're not paying attention and you know you have jet engines inches away from you and I don't, I don't know if you know but if you stand too close to a jet engine you could actually get sucked in as the power the power to like lift you off the ground like you're a fish in a, in a being flushed down a toilet bowl so you have to you always have to be focused which i i liken to very warrior energy yeah you know so it, having that razor like focus and uh composure you know is very important i i kind of imparted a lot of that from that experience you know very uh, warrior like energy you know, having like, a type of Zen in, in chaos is very important for character development. And, you know, I, th- I, 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 I certainly liken it to masculinity too. And I mean, what are your thoughts on, um, you know, uh, having men learn about things like this? Is this something that, uh, people can just read a book and, and get into or uh what 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 are your thoughts on how more men can learn about i guess archetypal things like king warrior magician and and impart some of those behaviors and and archetypes into their lives reading is a start but i i think um you know a lot of these things because they're archetypal they're a part of us you know these aren't just like abstract ideas that have been Mm. passed on they're there even if even if you were somehow able to re-engineer the culture where there was no warriors archetypes or magicians um they would arise again um because it's part of our nature Uh, and so in response to your question i think one of the ways of finding out about these things is um being with other men talking with other men um, they, uh, because a lot of it just naturally arises out of there. Um, but I think sports are great. That sort of controlled yeah. competition. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't know. I, I wish I could give a better answer to your question, but it just feels so big. Maybe if you, if you, I mean, that's a, uh, even though that it felt big, I felt like you gave such a, a, you know, important answer is that, yeah, be around other men, you know, be, be around, um, if you don't have like, you know, the father figure that let's say that I had, you, you need to be around other men who are going to naturally test you. I, I find that the first thing that happens when I'm around, uh, tribes of men is there's a investigation on, am I competent? Mm -hmm. And you want that you want, you want to be able to know if you're competent, you know, because you can't become competent if you have no idea or you refuse to know that, uh, you know, what you lack, um, so I think that's that was a critical answer. You should definitely, whether it's sports or um, any any activity that can you know put you. For me, it was bands. I was always in bands growing up, and with mostly guys. So that type of male camaraderie, and um, I think even through music, you know, the spontaneity of it and pushing each other and wanting to get better. It's a uh, very mission oriented. And I, I, I find that to be very uh, archetypal and ancient in, in masculine behaviors. You know, it's why you see men congregate to, towards a task. You know, it seems to be naturally activated where you have a uh, type of natural uh, checking, ribbing and checking on wanting to make sure everyone is becoming more competent. And, uh, you know, it could be around something as simple as fishing or, or, Hey, make sure you've checked every part of that plane, according to these list of aviation rules or else it could just be something very task oriented. But I think the process underneath reveals something more because I, I always notice that these, uh, uh, these behaviors tend to, uh, happen naturally. I, I like what the, what you said is that the archetypes are not just words on a page, right? They're not just symbols, but they, they can activate something deeper within us. 
Yeah. You know, another thing we can do is just consciously accept the idea that men of prior generations have something to give us, something to teach us. Because, I mean, there's this whole critique, the critical attitude that's really prevalent now is that everything from the past is really not of great value. Um, and specifically the past that we've inherited from, um, you know, the, the kind of the patriarchy. And so it's really easy to just like reject wholesale everything that, you know, people and men of the past um, have given. And that's just foolishness. So I think consciously embracing the idea that men of the past have something of value to give us is huge. It's huge. Um you know, another thing that comes to my mind is um, an an attitude that to me feels almost inherently masculine is the attitude that says there is something of value in suffering. Now, if you don't understand that in a balanced way, that can come off as like sheer masochism, and it can be, but. If you understand it in a more balanced way, it's just a recognition that going through the distress can be a good thing. Going through hard mm. can be a really good thing. It, your momentary comfort is not the higher goal. Your momentary comfort is, you know, one small value among many others. And, you know, this doesn't necessarily mean um, being, um, I mean, what I want to say is that even that discomfort can include things like deep emotion and deep grief. I mean, that can include the value of, um, you know, being able to weep over, you know, a lost loved one. That's going into pain and suffering, sure. emotional pain pain and suffering of grief and saying, yes, this has real value. But I also want to refer to like, you know, the pain and suffering of just like getting up at five in the morning, going to the gym and fucking working out an, an hour and a half before you see the first client and just pushing it disciplined, you know, just and embracing that. What's I think a lot of what's happening in the culture is just that we've come to associate any feeling of discomfort or even emotional pain is, oh, something's wrong, something needs to be changed. And my response is, well, maybe, yeah, some of the time, okay, but a lot of the time, no, it means you're in the right place, you're doing the right thing. It's like, yeah, it's, this is supposed to be hard. Growing up and becoming a full human being is not supposed to be always pleasant and easy. That's not, that's not it. Yeah, comfort is the enemy of progress, right? Of develop development, and it reminds me of what, something Carl Jung said: is that there's no coming to consciousness without pain. I, yeah, I think that's really mind blowing. Is that it's not just about um, the benefits of seeing something through, like you know, maybe a six pack abs, like 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 you have, because <laughs> for those who don't know. <laughs> Dr. Bray Alderman's ripped and jacked. It's so inspiring, you know, but, uh, you know, you can, you can commit to getting up at 5am cause you have this vision for your, you know, an ideal for how you want to look for your fitness goals. But then you, it, it what like Carl Jung said, it's uh, c coming to consciousness because you're you're also coming into awareness of the potential, and uh, I think Dr. Jordan Peterson talks a lot about potential, and it, it reminds me of something he said ab about uh, sacrificing short term gains for long term gains is is a part of that process. You know the trade off that you make, and we're always making trade offs. You know that the, the yeah the long term gains that you get from that trade off is a, a type of coming to consciousness I, when i'm talking about embracing distress and discomfort and suffering it's it's like it's both the emotional the things that are emotionally difficult and then also the physically difficult and and how they're related to one another yeah the bo the body and soul you know putting 
putting like your mind uh, to iron, uh, it's transformative. Uh, it reminds me of, you know, when I went through a big spell of depression in my early twenties, you know, I used to go walk at uh, train tracks at night and just sit around by myself, but just, just like watching trains, um, sort of, it really helped me, uh, realize that these, these things are temporary, like the coming and going and watching them, it, it had a meditative effect on my psyche. And I, every, every day, every week I would do this, it would make me feel better just knowing that, you know, how transitory things are, whether there are people that come and go in your life, emotions that come and go in your life and that, you know, they're, they're like trains. They're not, you know, I'm not the emotion, but they're just something passing by right now. You know, it takes me a lot to, uh, to why I, I also, you know, went into Buddhism a lot in my life and learning about not holding on to, um, certain desires and desires, meaning even, you know, the, the, the desire to be better. Sometimes you just have to eat shit and f go through the pain and, and not just want to be better, but rather, you know, really see the, the pain through and come out on the other side of it. And obviously as you know, your work in Jungian psychology, you know, more than anyone about the, the process of going through the shadow and doing the shadow work and why that's so important. Um, how do you think, uh, you know, you know, we've spoken about masculinity and society at large and, and even in, you know, in terms of gender warfare, but, uh, do you think like uh, shadow work is maybe more important now than, than ever? It feels that way. I mean, I don't know, but it sure as hell feels that way. I mean, I'm looking out at, you know, the, the cultural landscape of the U S right now. Um, and it feels so polarized and there is so much dehumanization. There is so much looking at the other as if he or she were completely, utterly other. Like there's no sense of, um, there's less and less sense of, um, there's just, there's just a more and more dissociation, more and more splitting, more and more seeing others as potentially evil. Um, it's frightening. You just watched a clip from the Masses podcast. Watch the full episode on our YouTube channel and subscribe for the latest content. The Masses.